Hello, and welcome to our webinar, An Afternoon of Art. I'm Julia Smith, Senior Editor for the Books for Youth Department at Booklist. Before we begin, I'd like to go over some technical details. The audience is in listen-only mode, but we welcome any questions you may have. On the bottom of your screen, there's a toolbar with a section for Q&A. If you have a question or need technical assistance, simply click Q&A and type your message into the box that appears. We will do our best to respond to all tech-related questions and we'll pass along all other questions to today's panelists so they can follow up with you after the webinar. Links to today's slides and title list were included in the reminder email you received from Zoom one hour ago. To download them, please open that email, scroll to the bottom, and click on the links located there. You can also download these materials at any time by copying the URLs on this screen into your web browser. Today, we have the pleasure of hearing from Jillian Tamaki, illustrator of My Best Friend, Lauren Stringer, illustrator of Looking for Smile, Lita Judge, author and illustrator of When You Need Wings, R. Gregory Christie, illustrator of Lift As You Climb, the story of Ella Baker, and Cosby Cabrera, author and illustrator of Me and Mama. And last but not least, Amy June Bates, author and illustrator of When I Draw a Panda. We will hear a brief presentation from each panelist and then we'll move on to our Q&A portion of the webinar. First up, we have Jillian Tamaki. Jillian is an illustrator and artist best known for her graphic novels. This one summer, co-created with Mariko Tamaki, was awarded a Caldecott honor, a Prince honor, and an Eisner award. She is the author illustrator of They Say Blue and the illustrator of My Best Friend by Julie Fogliano. Jillian lives in Toronto. Welcome Jillian, the floor is yours. Hi, can everybody hear me? I hope so, because I can't hear you. So <laughs> anyway, um, let's see. This is all kind of ragtag system. So hopefully there are no glitches. Yes, okay. Uh, so thank you for having me. Thanks for coming. Um, my best friend came out uh, earlier this year on March 4th, <laughs> right before everything went to lockdown. It seems like so, so long ago, even though it really isn't. Um, and it's a really weird time to have a new book out. It's, it's really, and especially this book, and it's about simple pleasures. It's about uh, connecting with a stranger. Um, uh, and it's really sort of difficult to talk about some of that simplicity in a time of quarantine and economic upheaval and displacement and racial uprising. Um, because this book is inherently anti-social distancing, uh, it is about feeling connected and feeling energized uh, by another person and feeling inspired by them. And Yet we're at this time, we're sort of told that to stay apart and stay away from one, one, one another is to, that is caring, um, that is love. Um, I don't personally have kids, but my friends uh, that do are kind of fretting about the impacts of children being kept apart from one another for so long. When I think about the book, though, I really am transported to um, the summer of 2018. I usually work in my house. Um, I always have. I have a studio uh, room in my apartment. Uh, but for this summer, my friend was going away and she just for a few months and she asked me if I would. She's a she's a ceramicist. You can see her big kiln in the background there. And she asked me if I wanted to uh, sublet her studio. And of course, I was like, of yes, <laughs> get out of my house. It was a beautiful space, as you can see. Um, and that summer was just, you know, getting up, riding down the rail path on my bike um, to this beautiful studio and, and working on a book and quilting, as you could see in that picture. Um, I'm also a quilter. So 
Uh, this book was done in a way that I had never worked before, which was on an iPad uh, in Procreate is the program. Horrible name, but great drawing program. And it really was an amazing new experience. The portability of not just a sketch, but your actual book that you're working on. Um, you could just sort of throw all of that into your bag and leave and sort of carry it around with you. And that was a totally new experience that I just thought was, I just wonder how it affected what I eventually came up with. You know what I mean? Um, uh, so earlier though, just to rewind, I had been doing, um, this is not done on, on, on the iPad, but it was um, a kind of illustration I was futzing around with. I'm a, I'm a person who likes to try on new things. And um, it's, it's drawn with graphite on um, like a vinyl, like a really thick sort of plastic paper. Uh, and it was this layered sort of technique where it's almost emulating like a silk screen. And I have some slides a little bit further on that kind of de demonstrate this, but it was a way of sort of using very, very limited color palettes and kind of combining them in the computer eventually. But uh, this just the challenge of sort of not using every uh, shade in the toolkit, you know? Um, and, uh, and this was another sort of like futzing around with this, uh, this technique. Eventually, uh, I did choose these four colors um, and that makes up the whole basis of the book. You can see the little palette, <laughs> the little mini palette um, on this picture. Um, and so I would sort of just dip in and out of that, of those four colors. So it is kind of a, a lithography sort of technique. Here's the yellow separation. And it was just done on four layers. Here's the pink separation. Here's the green separation. I guess they're more technically layers, but I call them separations as if it was sort of like a silk screen. And here's a dark red separation. Nope. And here they all are together, layered to create sort of a, like a simple palette, but, um, but hopefully rich, you know, there's a lot of, potential within just that limited palette. Here are some early drawings after I um, accepted the script, if, but before I started working on the sketches. And it's just mostly about spending time in that world and learning about those characters. And to be honest, this is always kind of the best part of the book process because the story is still fresh and still so full of possibility. Of course, there's a difference between one-off drawings and um, illustrations and characters that need to move and change over the course of the book and show different emotions and different angles. Next. And here's another, here's the other character. Next. Of course, this is the stage where I find myself pulling from my own experiences and the people I've known and thinking about old friends. And really the role of the best friend was based on a good friend I had at that time because, you know, um, and she was a brave sort of uh, girl that would be the one standing up on the swing and all of that and jumping off of stuff. And, and uh, she, she definitely made her way into the, um, into the, uh, the book. Giuliano's, uh, sorry, Julie Fogliano's script. This is sort of the process of how these things come together. Next. Uh, first pass. And they're just blobs at this point, obviously. The script spoke to uh, a really deep sense of play. Some of the images ended up being very close to the um, uh, final. Next. 
Next. Next. And some of them did not. Here's the sketch. Here's what it ended up being. Here's the sketch. And here's what it ended up being. And I'm just gonna skip along, show some other slides here. And that's it, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jillian. Next, we'll hear from Lauren Stringer. Lauren has illustrated many celebrated picture books, including Deer Dancer by Mary Lynn Ray, The Princess and Her Panther by Wendy Orr, Scarecrow and Snow, both written by Cynthia Ryland, as well as her own, Winter is the Warmest Season and When Stravinsky Met Nijinsky. She lives with her family in Minneapolis, Minnesota, Take it away, Lauren. Thank you. Next. Looking for Smile, written by Ellen Tarlow and illustrated by me. Next. In May of 2019, pre-pandemic, I was on the faculty of an intensive picture book writing workshop at the Writing Barn in Austin, Texas, along with the agent Ruben Pfeffer and the editor Alan Johnston of Beach Lane Books. We each shared our deep love of picture books and our publishing experiences with the workshop attendees. Next, each of us were given 10 or so manuscripts submitted by the participants in the workshop. And on the second night, post presentations, while waiting in the rain for an Uber to take us into downtown for dinner, Ruben said, I think I found a story you might want to publish, Alan. So underneath an umbrella, Alan read the manuscript out loud and the story instantly went to my heart and I just blurted out and I would like to illustrate it. So on one rainy night, the author, Ellen Tarlow's submitted manuscript garnered her an agent, an editor publisher and an illustrator. A three-way text after that fateful stormy night. There was definitely magic in that storm and in the story. The first line of the story says, Bear and Smile were always together. That is what I loved. Smile was an animated separate entity. Bear and Smile had stayed in my heart and when I got back to my studio, I painted this sketch and sent it to Alan, who loved it. Then she sent it to Ruben, who loved it, and he sent it to the author, Ellen Tarlow, who loved it, and the magic got stronger. In fact, the very first sketch stayed so, so long in our imaginations that it ultimately became the cover of the book. What was it that set my heart pounding and pictures forming themselves instantly in my head with that very first reading? It was bare and smile. It was Bear waking up in the morning, stretching wide, and Smile waking up and stretching wide, too. It was the fact that Bear and Smile liked to eat all of the same things, and they shared them perfectly. I loved that Bear and Smile went everywhere together. Bear loved waterfalls, Smile did, too, but often took a little longer to warm up. And they loved adventures together, as long as they weren't too scary. And of course, they both loved honey. I loved when the author said they were always together, bear and smile. Then the author wrote, then one morning, smile didn't come. We have all had those mornings, especially lately during this pandemic. There are so many mornings when I wake up and smile doesn't come. And on those days for me, the world loses its color. And I knew this is what had to happen to Bear too, a colorless world when smile would not come. And even food doesn't come, doesn't taste good when smile is not there. And when life loses all color, a sense of hopelessness sets in. Friends can be helpful. Rabbit is the kind of friend who problem solves and wants to put things right. Rabbit suggests solutions and Bear says,
Hi, everyone. This is Grace from Booklist. We just lost um, Lauren, so we are just going to move on to the next panelist and we'll come back. So if you'll just indulge us for one minute, we'll be right with you. Okay, we will definitely finish that up in a few minutes. Um, but moving on to our next illustrator, we have Lita Judge. Thanks so much for being here with us. Lita is the award-winning author and illustrator of many children's books, including Even the Smallest Will Grow, When You Need Wings, Flight School, Penguin Flies Home, Red Sled, Red Hat, Good Morning to Me, Born in the Wild, and her illustrated young adult novel, Mary's Monster. She lives with her husband, two cats, and a parrot in New Hampshire. Take it away, Lita. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, I'm gonna see if I can get the next slide. Um, I'm sorry that we can't gather in person, but I'm so um, thankful for Simon Schuster and Booklist for putting this together. And I just want to welcome you to my studio here in New Hampshire. Next. I'm going to be talking my book, about my book, When You Need Wings. Um, this is a story, it came out right at the beginning of the pandemic. And it's actually um, bizarre how timely it is in that I was writing about um, a little girl who faces her first day of school and she's feeling a lot of anxiety and she's very shy and she's feeling very overwhelmed and it was inspired by a, um, a personal experience that I had, which is why I'm showing a picture from my childhood, but um, I, I now and I was thinking about kids that I meet in schools and, and all the anxiety they face. But now, you know, unfortunately, we're all facing those um, those unknowns. In the story, the, the little girl who's facing this anxiety, rather than panicking, she takes a moment to reflect and disappear into her own imagination. And there she gathers her strength and her courage um, to face the world. And this is something that I did a lot when I was a kid. I was a very shy kid because I was born on a remote part of Alaska and my family lived way out in the woods and I didn't get to see kids a lot. And so when we actually moved to closer to town, I faced a lot of anxiety and a lot of adjustment um, when I was suddenly able to be around kids. Um, so I, but I had a very creative mind because I grew up living in the woods and kind of had to entertain myself. Um, I did have a really strong connection to nature and wildlife and that's why I wanted to show this picture um, today because that informs a lot of the art that I create. A lot of my stories either are nonfiction about nature or I use animals in my stories to um, create characters because that's where I'm comfortable um, and those are the stories I like to create. Next. Um, so I'm an avid travel sketcher and journal keeper and I just draw, I try to do a daily practice of drawing and sometimes that will spark an idea for a book. In this case, I had been thinking about anxiety, but I hadn't found a way into a story. And I'd been drawing a lot of tigers. And then one day I drew a little girl with a tiger. And that's what really sparked my way into this story. A um, lot, lot, lot of times, a lot of my books will be inspired by my sketchbooks. And one thing is I'm actually very dyslexic. And so learning how to write and learning how to read when I was a kid was a struggle, but I um, have a very visual brain and I see stories in my mind long before I hear them. So rather than working at a typewriter, I work at a storyboard. These are just two sketches on my storyboard, but I will see a story kind of unfold and I drew literally hundreds and thousands of sketches. And in these sketches, I'm developing the character and the setting and even the plot rather than writing words, I draw out um, the images that I'm seeing. It's a labor intensive way to work, but it works really well for me because by the time I get a full stitch dummy together, I know the story in and out and I can then create um, the manuscript and it comes very natural, naturally to me that way. Once I know what the book is about and the script, then I have to go out to um, life and gather experiences so that I can create those illustrations. 
Um, I like to work from life as much as possible. So I'll invite kids to model for the children. This um, book is set in a woodland setting. So I work in the woods. Um, I also work with a lot of animals so that I can create my illustrations. Rather than using reference I can find online, I like to work from nature. Um, it's really easy to learn how to draw a tiger, but what's hard is to come up with the gestures and the emotions to tell your story. And so a lot of times I'll work with animals that, I, that are close to me and I just watch how they move. Kids too, I watch their body language and get ideas for the sketches um, so that I can bring the story together. The composition is, a, is probably my biggest tool. I'm constantly thinking about how I can refine and tell the gestures even better. Um, this is a moment in the story where the girl has been in her imaginary world and then she's going back into reality and she's gathered her strength and her joy. In the beginning, in the imagine where, imaginary world, she makes friends with a tiger and he kind of helps her find her strength and joy. So in the upper left, you can see the initial sketch I did. And I had him wrapping his arms around her and she was feeling very joyful, but I realized the strength was coming from the tiger. So in the upper middle, you can see that um, he's pushed back and you see her close up, but I realized that's still not telling the story. I needed to really focus in on her. So ultimately you can see in the composition I came up with, I really focused on her and the, the wing beats that take her to her imagined world are it's her heartbeat, only she imagined those that she has wings. And so I focused in on that composition um, to tell the story. Color is also a really important tool. Before I do an illustration, I do a lot of little color sketches. Um, the challenge for this book was that there's the imagined world and the real world, and I needed to separate the two. So the real world has more realistic colors. This is the imagined world, and I want it to be her safe place where she feels really strong and protected. And so all the colors are really harmonized to her. I had the tiger, I picked a tiger because he has the same color scheme as she is. And instead of painting the woods natural greens and blues, I thought I'm gonna just make everything key to her because this is her safe imagined world. And then that is different from the um, real world that you can see. This is near the beginning of the book when she's in the real world. You see a lot of lavenders and blues. Um, I think of these colors as being more like on a gray day, you might feel um, depressed or perhaps stressed. You know, color conveys so much of emotion and I want to, um, I want to use that color in order to create the story. So here you see her going off to school and she arrives um, at the playground. I don't use a lot of words, but you see from her body language and her gestures that she's feeling stressed and she wants to run. But rather than um, panicking, she takes a moment to just reflect and she's listening to her heart. And instead she imagines for herself um, her wing beats and she carries off into the imagined world. And here you can see the, the uh, color has shifted into that imaginary world and she meets a new friend at this imaginary world. Can, next, can we have the next slide? Um, she meets a new friend and you see a lot of the details from her uh, real world kind of showing up in this imagined world. And here she feels safe to make those friendships and she's finding her strength and her joy. If, next. Um, and then eventually she goes back to the playground and you can see that the, the things that she has imagined in her imaginary world were actually inspired all along by the kids that she saw on the playground. Next. And then she is ready to face her day. Next. So thank you for, um, I hope this offers some inspiration and I know I'm enjoying um, our being able to gather together in this way. So thank you. Thank you so much. Now we will hear from our Gregory Christie. Our Gregory Christie received a Caldecott honor for his illustrations in Freedom in Congo Square, written by Carol Boston Weatherford. He is a three-time recipient of the New York Times' 10 Best Illustrated Children's Books of the Year Award, a six-time recipient of the Coretta Scott King Honor Award in Illustration, and a winner of the Boston Globe Hornbook Award, the NAACP's Image Award, and the Once Upon a World Children's Award from the Museum of Tolerance. Take it away, Greg. Thank you very much for the time to speak about this book, Lift As You Climb, and I'm happy to be here with everyone. 
Um, before we get to the first slide, I want you to take a look at the cover and see how the uh, design was put on. What I want you to focus on is the, the actual character, Ella Baker, Ella Jo Baker, who was almost, you know, when I saw images of her, she almost looked like a little grandmother. But when I saw videos, I saw how she really would get in people's faces and, and really empower them. And it wasn't, it was a nice balance. And there was, there was, there was a substance to, a substance to like what she felt and how she did it. And so what I feel is when I wanted to do the cover, I wanted to make sure that as soon as you looked at it, you saw almost like a ray of light and you saw energy. That's why I chose yellow. You also see uh, complementary, complementary colors like purple. So I go back to what I learned in art school about colors that, that kind of complete each other. But when you actually look at her, her clothing, I scraped into it. I used texture. I used texture throughout the whole book for substance. I used translucence to soften things. And I used opacity to make sure that it really had like a uh, emotional impact on you. So let's go to the first slide. This is a, a more detailed view of, of the collage and scraping and the texture that you'll see. I have done lots of books and I think around, maybe it must have been around 2004, I stopped using acrylic and I use a paint called acrylic gouache. Acrylic gouache is a mixture of acrylic and gouache paint. It's, it's fairly new. Most paint is very old except for acrylic. Acrylic is like 1950s, used to be a house paint. But oil paint, gouache, watercolor, that, these are very old paints. Acrylic gouache was just something someone told me in the art store, have you tried it? And this was in the 90s and I just said, yeah, let me see. And, and once I, I really uh, got put it on my palette and started using it, it, it became the voice for almost all my books and projects. What I like about the paint is that when you put it down, it stays down and it really is uh, opaque, meaning you cannot see the paper come through it. But if you put mediums and gloss in it, it can be very translucent. So the paper can give it um, almost an imperfection because paint, if it's put down too heavily, sometimes it comes too plasticky and it looks like paint. I want it to feel folk art like, I want it to also feel very um, you know, solid and I want it to also create an emotional impact. So let's go to the next slide. Whenever you do a book dealing with civil rights, you have to think about uh, doing it in a way that's responsibly, you have to do it responsibly. So, when it's linked to a particular person, you have to get the person that most people know because you have to think about their lifelong features, their posture, um, the world that was around them, the colors, the decorations. This book, I mostly knew I'd be painting in the 60s and I thought about the colors of that time period, but I really got into doing different um, you know, hairstyles and things like that. But I, I picked this Ella Baker for most of the book but I had to do it when she was very young. So let's go to the next slide. So this is the different faces of Ella Baker. And that's what I mean about which one do I pick? Which one do the people who do know her, which one most represents her and her essence? And so you have to render a person's essence and what most people remember to them to have been. Next slide. When I do a book uh, like this and it's historical, I have to go back and find pictures of, of what people wore. Um, I had to find out like the world around them, the trees, the, the uh, land, was there grass? Did people stand on dirt roads in front of their shacks? Did they have tin buildings? Did they have wooden buildings? I do all that research. And I also, so that I don't become too realistic, I look at an artist that reinterprets all this world. And I love Bromer Bearden. There's a little snippet of his work up there. And I just like his flat graphic style of painting. 
where he can take something that looks, it's, it's a collage and it's also paint, but it, it has like an expansion where you really get pulled back into a land. So in one way, it's a flat window. Like you're looking out a window and you just see almost like someone's holding up a poster and you just see something flat, but, in, but it also has a depth. So it's something that's a foreground that's really up there, but it has a lot of depth while being childlike. Next slide, please. I do many different styles, many different books. So when I was doing Ella Baker, I just had to find the right one. I thought about being very edgy and, and, and I also thought about maybe I could do silhouettes or, you know, so I thought about different things, but I realized with the subject matter, a subject matter is very appropriate to these times with people protesting. And, you know, when I do children's books, I try to think about how to, to really like, pull it together where it, it can be responsible for today. So let's go to the next slide. And, you know, once I figured my style, I, I found it. Let's go to the next slide. I start with a sketch. I, I make sketches that give me enough room to do what I need to do, where I'm not locked into it. Let's go to the next slide. And I bring it into what feels good emotionally, color, and, and um, different types of uh, you know, shapes really help define the book and define the emotions I wanna pull out. Next slide, please. Sketches again, these are ideas for the cover. And also, you know, even the, the color image could have been a nice cover too, but I like the idea of her really being a, a female and a woman saying, you know, get out and vote and lift as you climb. Next slide, please. So we I had to do progression of her age is when she was young. Next slide. And these are the details of the different things. You have to um, get these right. Everything from the buttons to berets and little girls' hairs into uh, a rich person from the South versus a poor person from the South. You do your research visually and you, you reinterpret it in a way that people can digest it. Next slide. So, as you can see, the colors are almost like bubblegum pink and things like that. But, you know, I, my time's just about up, but I just want you to see, we'll go through the last few and we can finish up in questions. Next slide, please. And just keep going through. And thank you guys for the time. Thank you so much, Greg. Next we have Cosby Cabrera. Cosby received a BFA from Parsons School of Design. Her cloth dolls have got garnered the attention of collectors around the world and have been featured on the Oprah Winfrey Show. She is the illustrator of several books, including the picture book, Beauty, Her Basket, which Publishers Weekly called A Quiet Treasure in a starred review. Her work is featured in her eponymous shop and atelier in Brooklyn. She lives in New York City. Cosby will kick off her presentation with a video. Thanks so much for having me and thanks for organizing this book list and Simon and & Schuster. I want to share just a, a hint of what motivated and inspired me uh, to write and illustrate me and Mama. Here we go. Me and Mama an ode to the everyday. The everyday, a string of moments from you, good morning to you, to good night. It started with a cup, my favorite cup of all time, and my three-year-old was trying to get me a glass of water, unsolicited. It was that precise moment that I recognized that joy sits squarely on the shoulders of equanimity. Early on, I saw it as a simple book with very sparse language. We would trace this tenderness between mother and daughter through their everyday objects. In the same way an anthropologist might surmise a number of things about a people by rummaging through their objects and everything of theirs that was tethered to utility. 
I would share very little of this mother and daughter, a few suggestions, half hints, maybe a spread or two. But for the most part, the challenge was to let the story in and allow the reader to fill in the gaps and bring shape to the text. After revising, the question of to show or not to show became, where will this go? And it was now about the string of moments where time is irrelevant and the soul is being nourished, watered, and fed. It's that adage about the days are long and the years are short. And there's time to play. And when we have no idea what we're doing and we're allowed the space to do some things imperfectly. Until we get it. When it's raining, we find the fun. And something like getting into the shower, a potential friction point, reminds us of that rain. And we get to compare and contrast because that's how we sort and connect our dots. Observe and say or think this to that. Not this, but that. And the dark, the thing we fear and from which we hide. Is waiting for us. So we can get to the rich stuff, those places we get to process and replay and even conjure up reminders of who we love and who loves us and how we share those string of moments from good morning to good night. Uh, so I wanted to share just some of the end papers here. We're looking at little objects and my hope is that kids, you know, early readers and pre-readers will be inspired to run around the house and uh, just start naming things, reinforcing their vocabulary, um, comparing uh, size and textures and colors and all of the various things that kids observe early. Uh, this is our beginning spread here. These are painted in acrylics. I'm showing a little bit of their uh, home space. And, and uh, here's a child looking out the window. That's something we oftentimes do to set the tone for the day, to look outside and see what's going on. Uh, and this is a cup. Uh, I'm gonna read just a moment. It says, this is mama's cup. Sometimes I take a cool sip, but I have to be careful because her cup is breakable. Next. This is my cup. Mama's cup goes clink, clink with a spoon. My cup goes da, da, clink, clink, da, da, clink, 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 clink. Mama says, sometimes things break. So this whole notion of um, the relationship between mother and daughter, can we move on to our next slide? Yeah and the many comparisons that happen in the course of an ordinary day. Next. Yeah, we're gonna just rapid fire through these if we can just keep going, thank you. I'm essentially just showing the art. There we are with their silver dresses. Oatmeal in the pot, morning breakfast. And, you know, these idea, the, the idea of um, creating these morning and bedtime rituals uh, for children um, oftentimes are very much empowering because they can begin to anticipate, which in and of itself is a muscle. So this is uh, them in nature. You know, the sky is taller, taller than the trees. And so this is a child's observations. Yes, splash. And so bedtime. And this idea that in being able to anticipate the sequence of events, we give our children power because they're able to then find their own and locate their own rhythms in the course of, you know, that, that sequence of events. So they have a little control. There we are. We can continue. Yeah, being tucked in. The goodnight kiss, of course. Represent representing her take on the dark and all of the many images that she's able to conjure up. And so thank you. 
and good afternoon, <laughs> I should sing, um, and peekaboo. Next and last slide. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cosby. Our next presentation will be from Amy June Bates. Amy has illustrated books, including the Sam the Man series, Sweet Dreams, and That's What I Do, both by singer-songwriter Jewel, and Waiting for the Magic by Matricia McLaughlin. She is the author-illustrator of The Big Umbrella, which Booklist raved, a boundlessly inclusive spirit. This open-ended picture book creates a natural springboard for discussion. She lives in Carlisle, Pennsylvania with her husband and three children. Take it away, Amy. Hello. It's exciting to be doing this. These COVID times have been very strange. There are so many problems globally, and this month has been a tricky one for us with school starting and fires and other dilemmas. So I hope you are well wherever you are, and thank you for the invitation to present this book and for joining me here today. When I Draw a Panda. In some ways, this has been a very good time for this book with so many kids at home in flux, out of their usual routine, and parents looking for things to do with their kids. There has been a huge surge of interest in drawing and learning how to draw. I've been sharing how to draw lessons on social media that came directly out of this book. It started with my kids and nieces and nephews, but it's been a really great way to connect with people and see drawing happening out there. It's been really inspiring to me and a way that I can give back. I'm excited now to share this book with people. So a little about me. I've been illustrating books for almost 20 years. I love reading and drawing, so it's not really a big mystery why I got into the job that I have. I don't know if you remember the kid in school that loved Garfield and was like, I really wanna grow up and be a cartoonist. Well, that was me and I never really grew out of that wish. I work in my attic drawing pictures, and I have a couple of kids and a couple of dogs. This one husband, but I'm allergic to cats. A couple of years ago, I wrote my first book with my daughter called The Big Umbrella, and now I have a new book coming out called When I Draw a Panda. Some of the things in this book I've been thinking about for years, some more recently and some very recently. Almost every child loves to draw. I say almost because for every imperative, there are exceptions. However, I believe that our desire to notice and capture and recreate the patterns that we see in our world, even from a very, very young age, is something that makes us uniquely human. When I talk to groups of children, I always ask the question, how many of you love to draw? When I ask kindergartners, they all raise their hands, some so fast that they can barely stay in their seats. When I ask the same question to second graders, they almost always raise their hands. And in third grade, it's the same. In fourth grade, not quite as many. In fifth grade now, only five or six actually say they like to draw. And adults, I've talked to rooms of adults who won't raise their hands. But when I ask the question, how many of you wish you could draw, then everyone raises their hand. So what happened? Well, I have a theory. I think everyone actually likes to draw, and I think that a lot of people have forgotten how. We measure our abilities by looking at other people. We start saying, I can't, or I can only draw stick figures. We start risking a little less and worry a little more, and then we give up. The beautiful thing about the way really little kids draw is that they rarely ask themselves if they can draw something because they already know they can. There isn't really a separation between what is in their head and what they can draw on paper. This is a drawing by my niece of a zebra. Do you know how many four-year-old kids have told me they already know how to draw a zebra? A lot. 
So how do we get to age 40 or 14 or eight and have totally forgotten how to draw? Can only artists draw? Well, that thought makes me sad. So the first people this book is for are the people that forgot they can draw but still want to draw deep down in their long ago hearts. My story starts here with a girl that thinks she can't draw, but she does the hardest thing you can do sometimes. She begins anyway. Sometimes it's even okay to start without knowing where you're going. You just have to start and see where it leads. This book is also about individuality. I have a child that is autistic, and by no means do I attempt to speak for all autistic individuals, because if I have learned anything, I have learned that just like no two people are alike, no two autistic people are alike. My smart, wonderful kid is stuck right in this spot where a lot of his individuality is seen as something to fix. The right way to do things is always in flux, just like the word normal, which is a word that definitely needs rethinking, especially this year, 2020. So this book is for the people that question, that ask why, that tap and fidget, that look out windows and daydream because there's something more interesting to see or do or think about. Or they simply must question what actually is the right way to do something. This book is for my son. In art, the rules are unclear. The expectations are squishy. The challenge and the beauty is that there is no one way. Mistakes are imperative. You absolutely have to make them. All this can be a challenge for neurodiverse thinkers as well as any thinkers. No one likes to make mistakes, but the fact is we have to. Sometimes that thought can make you feel stuck, stuck between moving forward or backwards, scared of making mistakes. The truth is that there are some rules and there are some rules you can break. It isn't all one way or another, it's somewhere in between. So this book is for the kid that is stuck. The message to this kid is don't give up. Make something. Make something that makes you happy and don't worry about anyone else. The next person this book is for is me. In this book, I am the girl and the panda is my son. And this is me learning to rethink what I think I know about anything. Sometimes the right way is the left way. Sometimes crazy is crazy good. Finally, this book is for you. You can draw perfectly, imperfectly. You can break all the art rules or keep them. It is up to you. Now go draw your own way. In my book, a girl creates a panda. They go on a drawing adventure and it turns out that she learns to not take things so seriously. She realizes that making something that makes you happy will likely make others happy too. And that is what I did. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now we are going to go back to Lauren to continue her presentation. Um, just take a moment to get the slides queued up and then whenever you're ready, Lauren, you can hop in. Here we are. Um, I, I'm sorry I lost you, but I think I was telling you how Rabbit was the kind of friend who had lots of ideas and lots of suggestions, and Bear said good thinking. Next slide. But friend suggestions don't always work when we're feeling down. Next. And then there are the kind of friends like Bird. Bird has empathy. Bird is able to understand and put herself in Bear's shoes because Bear, Bird has probably been there. Bird is willing to sit close and listen. And Bird begins to sing softly. And Bear tries hard to hum along. And Bird and Bear sing and hum and watch the swirling leaves together and something will happen. But instead of telling you how the story ends, I'm going to share with you how I painted the story. Next slide. This is one story that almost seemed to paint itself. 
I let the emotions of the story inspire the color, the shapes, and compositions. I have great respect for emotions and feelings. I have been bear, and I have been rabbit, and I have been bird. I felt them all in my body and wanted to express the story from the inside out. When I begin the illustrations for a story, the first thing I do is write that story very large on sheets of paper and hang them on my studio wall so I don't lose it in a stack of papers. Next, I start a sketchbook dedicated to the story looking for smile. And inside, I staple the manuscript on the first page of the sketchbook so I never lose it. And I begin to collect images to inspire the characters. My sketchbook is where I draw my first impressions and develop my ideas, sometimes adding color, sometimes not. And occasionally, a sketch in my sketchbook needs no changes and is perfect to become a final illustration. I also do dozens and dozens of sketches on separate sheets of paper trying to get to know my characters. And dozens and dozens of color sketches too, finding emotion and action in color. I love to look at the art by other artists. And here, I love the self-portrait by the artist Paula, Paula Moderson Becker and decided my bear might also like to be surrounded by flowers or irises. And the image became spot art on the inside flap of the book, introducing the reader to a gentle bear and smile who both love irises. Painting the final illustrations often has to be done over and over. And in this case, the author wrote, bear looked up, he looked down, he looked inside, he looked outside. I have always loved this spread. I thought about how a child often looks inside by covering their eyes. So Bear covers his eyes with his paws. But even though I love the spareness of the clouds and the water, I remembered that I had painted Bear in a river by a waterfall, so I had to repaint the painting for a better sense of place. Here you can see the Bear with pine trees and waterfall all around. While working on the illustrations, my studio wall begins to fill with finished and half finished illustrations and they begin to have conversations with one another, telling me what they need to become a whole picture book. I set up a cardboard wall at my studio or my drafting table so I can bring the images close that are consecutive in the book so they can be close and I can match colors and scenery. And when it is finished, all of the illustrations gather in one place on my studio wall and I go over them with a fine tooth comb looking for missing claws or leaves or trees. And then I mail them to the publisher where they turn it into a picture book looking for smile. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lauren. Okay, we will only have a few minutes at this point for Q&A, but we'll get in it into it. So I'm going to turn on my video. I think everyone else is going to join me here. Um, yeah, thank you so much for these great presentations and welcome. So I guess I would start by asking, some of you are working with a different authors as a collaboration. Some of you are writer and illustrator. Um, so sort of generally, what makes you decide that a certain story is the one you want to tell or be involved with? And anyone can just jump in. For me, it's usually one line, like with looking for smile, when I heard the line, one day smile didn't come. That just, I said, oh, I have felt those days. And so I just, I could, I knew that that line was a turning point and that colors would change and the whole book would take on a whole new look. So I, I just felt like I had to take on that book right away. And I was so glad that I was able to. I love it. I tend to work with historical books and I have a criteria. I want the book I had, I wish I had when I was a child. And as long as it's very responsibly done, um, I'm, I'm drawn to it. And also I want something that could just go beyond uh, Black History Month and be considered American history. Sure, anyone else? If not, I can move on to something now. All right, here we go. Um, I, I too write um, oh, yes. a lot of 
nonfiction and fiction. And for me, kind of one of the qualifying things is it takes a couple of years to create a book and it has to be something that speaks to you on a level where you become obsessed with it. And you can't, you can't not do the book. If you can, if you can walk by an idea without doing it, then it's not the right idea. If you have an idea and you feel so compelled that you want to spend two years working on it, then you just trust that that's, that's the one you have to do. Thank you. Um, we had a couple of you mention in your presentation some other artists that you like or look up to. But I was just curious, who are some of your favorite illustrators or artists? Although I have so many, I just, and they're always changing. I mean, they shift just because we're always, all these new illustrators are always being um, introduced. And I just have to say today, watching everyone's show, I have a whole lot of new favorite illustrators. So I'll just start there. I'll, someone else carry on. <laughs> I, I personally, I like um, anyone who distorts the body. So Diego Rivera, Basquiat, Picasso. So I like people who have studied and I really like it when they study academic or classical painting and then can jump into a, a different type of voice. But I like anyone who distorts the human body. I really like, um, I like the history of art and the history of illustration. And um, when I was a kid, I was really into sort of, uh, sort of turn of the century artwork. But I also lived in Japan for three years, and so I um, I think right now I'm really really into um, a lot of Japanese illustrators. I really like Komako Sakai and Akiko Miyakoshi, yeah, Miyakoshi and um, I really like woodblock woodblock printing and the sort of layering of. Um, color and different effects that that makes and just textury printing looking things but I love it all I feel like a magpie just want to grab every interesting thing <laughs> yeah and you know I was acquainted with R. Gregory's uh, Christie's work uh, many many moons ago and what drew me to his work is I felt um, there was an emotional component that was more than, and this is what I look for in art in general. I, that's why I love Diego Rivera's work. Um, there's something that's I would consider unnamed, you know, and sometimes it feels as if it was like generations in the making, um, so that I, I moved by it. You know, I also see that in Isabel um, Arnaud's work. You know, it's um, I don't know, just something that somehow of it you're brought to tears and you wonder oh, what's going on but yeah it's just uh just root deep really yeah i would say um i think every artist is sort of a, a magpie as somebody else mentioned and just um is drawing from so much i think that uh to um the story at hand though and sort of some things just seem like more natural fits and it's all intuitive. It's all from the inside and what feels right. And I think for this book that I was working on, it really did have a sense of intimacy and coziness and like insularity, like the whole world falls away when you're playing with somebody else. And so I think that I was really looking to sort of classic mid-century, I guess mid 20th century, <laughs> uh, like, you know, Wesley Dennis, which I just love the um, Marguerite Henry illustrations or Garth Williams. Um, because they just had that sense of sort of like uh, coziness and like insularity and intimacy. So that was one thing that I was drawing on from uh, for this book. Fantastic. I'm, I hate to say it, but that's all we have time for right now. Um, thank you guys so much for joining us and presenting your work and explaining your processes. It was really wonderful to get that insight. So now just a couple final slides to wrap us up. On Monday, all attendees will receive an email containing links to today's slide presentation, title list, certificate of completion, and video recording. For more about Booklist webinars, 
be sure to visit booklistonline.com slash webinars, where you can visit, view archives of past and register for upcoming webinars like those you see here. And if you haven't already, be sure to check out the Booklist Reader, where Booklist contributors post daily about all things books and library land. Did you know that Booklist content is freely available for one more week? Starting with, oh, sorry, start reading with our digital edition, a format that pairs the page by page reading experience of print with the convenience of online access at booklistonline.com and lock in print, online, digital, and archive access by taking advantage of this special webinar offer to get Booklist for only $75. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, and one more thank you to all of our wonderful panelists and to our sponsor, Simon & Schuster Children's Publishing. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you.